this evening's lecture where we're going to be talking about poultices. Poultices are little packages you can make of vegetable matter that you would put on various ailments for various effects. And the first one I'm going to look at is the onion. And the onion is a drawer. I think most people are aware of that. If you have a room that's just been painted and has a strong odour, you can slice the onion up and put it on a plate and it'll absorb the odours out of the air. If you have a, a fridge that has a bad smell, number one, find out where it's coming from. Eliminate that, but sometimes the smell can remain. You can slice up an onion and put it in the fridge and it'll absorb those odours. So it is fairly well acknowledged that the onion is a drawer. You can use onion cooked or you can use it raw. And the cooked onion, in my knowledge, is used for two main reasons. One is for an earache. And it was the first poultice that I ever did. The little old lady next door told me about it. And she said, you steam an onion. Now you either steam it or dry bake it because if you boil it, some of the healing properties in the onion will go into the water. So you, you usually do it. Now my helpers very efficiently took the skin and the end off, but you actually leave all that on because <laughs> that'll help to hold it together. And then when it's, when it's um, soft, you cut it in half and you cut it in half across ways. So you're now looking at the, at the rings. And what you can do is you can squeeze it, squeeze some of the juice from the steamed onion. It'll be boiling. And when it hits the spoon, it'll cool a little. And then you can put that into the ear and that can bring a bit of relief. And then you, wrap up the onion in a cloth. Now you can use a cloth like this, which is, looks like it's a cut up from an old sheet, or you could use a hand towel or a tea towel. So you wrap it over a few times because remember it's boiling hot. And when you get it to the right temperature, test it on your arm, then it can be placed on the ear. And then you will put a little sheet of plastic over that which will keep the warmth in and then you could bandage it on the ear or you could put a little woolen beanie on to hold it there or some people might feel to sleep and they will lay, lay down on the ear. As long as you can keep it warm, you can keep it there. If it starts to get cold, then the ear will ache. Now this hot onion, the heat has an effect to relieve the pain because whenever you've got pain you've got cramping muscles and moist heat relaxes cramping muscle so that moist heat will do that but also the onion being a drawer will draw. Now sometimes the onion will cause a little hole to be made in the eardrum. If the body makes the hole not a problem. If you stick something in your eardrum and make a hole you got a problem. But if the body makes it, and often when the hole is made, then the pus will come out and that can bring a lot of relief. But sometimes the onion will just reduce the inflammation to the point that the blood will, may, may take the pus away. Um, either way, it brings a lot of relief. Now, you might do an onion poultice on someone with an earache and they get a lot of relief and then a few hours later the pain comes up again just do it again you just keep doing it until there is no more ache sometimes one application is enough sometimes it needs to be done a couple of times a day for a few days a friend of mine she had to do it every day for a week you know whatever it takes the body knows what it's doing and if it brings relief the body's saying thank you that's that's what i want you to do the other place that you can use a cooked onion is on a boil. A man rang me up and he said that he had boils coming on the inside of his nose, are very painful. And I said, well, it'll be a bit hard to put something on the inside of the nose, but I said you could steam up an onion and put it on the, on the outside. He thought that sounded like a bit of work until a few hours later the whole side of his face swelled up so he steamed up in onion and put it on. 
and he said to me that it brought so much relief he was able to sleep and when he woke up he said the boil had burst and all the waste had come away. He said he has never got so much relief so quickly because a boil inside the nose as you can imagine is, is very painful. Most pain is due to inflammation so if you can get that inflammation down you can reduce the pain. So it can be used on a boil and it can be used on a earache. That's the cooked onion. Now we're going to have a look at the raw onion. So the raw onion can be used for a few things. Now if you have a organic, non-GO, non-irradiated onion and you cut it up, you'll start crying, won't you? That onion juice has an effect to stimulate the respiratory organs to clear and to thin the mucus. So the cooked onion, as I said, is for ear and for a boil, but the raw onion is used often mostly for respiratory. Now you might be surprised at where I'm going to put this or where I'm going to suggest putting this onion that I'm chopping up and that is on the bottom of the feet for a head cold or a chest cold. You see the biggest pores in the whole of your body are on the soles of your feet. So what you do is you get a plastic bag thus and you put the onion in the plastic bag and then the foot is put on the, let's say this is the foot, you put it on the onion in the plastic bag and then twist this bag around and around and secure it and then put a sock on and the sock will hold it nice and nice and firm. You want the onion on the bottom of the feet because the biggest pores in your body are on the bottom of your feet and the body will take the onion where it needs to go and often it'll take it if you need it in the chest or to clear the head. I was with my daughter and her little three-year-old We'd put him to bed, he had a cold and he coughed and he coughed and you think any moment he'll fall asleep. But an, half an hour later he was still coughing and I said to my daughter, Emma, just get him up and we'll do the onion. We put the onion on the bottom of his feet, put the sock on, put him back to bed, not one more cough. It's almost unbelievable what it does. <laughs> and a friend of mine, she was, she was camping uh, in the bush, you know, near the beach, and the lady in the tent next door coughed all night. She said they it kept waking them. So the next day in the afternoon, she befriended the lady and she said, I noticed you have a cough. And the lady said, oh, I'm so sorry if I've kept you awake. And my friend said, I've got a little tip that may help you. Now, when you're camping, you've nearly always got an onion and you've just about always got plastic bags. And so she did it to the lady who was <coughs> willing to do anything. No coughing all night long. It's such a simple treatment and yet quite uh, effective. The, the bottom of the feet do not get tender. It doesn't irritate. Um, obviously, once you take it off in the morning, you would throw it away. But that's a very simple treatment that can be done for someone with, with respiratory or a cough. And now we're going to have a look at how you can make an onion cough syrup. So you need a jar and you'll put a layer of onion in the bottom of the jar. The layer of onion may be about half an inch. And then you put a spoonful of honey on that. So we'll put our spoonful of honey on that. Now when, when you buy raw honey in the winter, it's often quite solid. Have you found that? Mm -hmm. And you can do this with the solid honey. And whether it's a runny honey like this, or whether it's a solid honey, it will, they will both work. I'm making this at the beginning of our lecture because by the end of the lecture you'll see a syrup will begin to form. So now we're putting in another layer of, of onion. The first time I read about this recipe it said to use sugar, but I didn't give my children sugar so I really didn't want to make it with sugar. 
So I thought, I'll try it with honey, and it works very well with honey. And honey can be very soothing too on a, on a sore throat. So now we cut up and do another layer. So if you have a big family and they've all got bad coughs, you could do several onions and fill the jar. So for purposes of illustration, we're just going to use our one onion. So we put another layer in. And another layer of honey. Now the sky's the limit with how you make this. You can put garlic in there, you can put ginger in there as well as you, if you like. Now our last layer goes in and you end with a layer of, of honey. And drizzle it over. And if my grandchildren would hear, I would give them this spoon to lick. So as you can see at the moment, we've just got sticky, sticky onion and, sorry, sticky honey and onion. By the end of the lecture, in fact in about half an hour, you'll find a runny syrup. It's actually almost runny like water and that's your onion syrup. So you leave the onion in the honey for 24 hours and after 24 hours, in fact you'll see it even tomorrow through the day, it'll look like onion swimming in a syrup. So the reaction of the onion, the sticky onion on, sticky honey on the onion, it produces this syrup. So after 24 hours, you strain the onion out and there you've got your onion syrup which you can keep in the fridge. How long will it keep for? Well, I always used to say it doesn't keep long in my house. My children very much like the onion syrup. But one German lady in a meeting one day, she said, oh, I've had a jar in my fridge for, for 10 years. I guess because it's uh, honey, it, it keeps. So what's the dosage? Well, in a little two-year-old, you might give them half a teaspoon three times a day, you know. For an older child or an adult, you might give them a teaspoon three times a day. I used to say to my children if they had a bad cold, if you sit still and let mummy put poultices on you and put a few things on you, then you can have a teaspoon of onion syrup. <laughs> now, my children, I did not give them lollies, so they thought the onion syrup was pretty good. But I guess if children are used to a lot of sweet things, I don't know, you'll have a taste tomorrow. <laughs> but it's actually quite a nice syrup. Something else I'm going to do early in our lecture is uh, castor oil compress so that you can see how it soaks in. It can take nearly half an hour to soak in. Now castor oil penetrates deeper than any other oil and wherever castor oil penetrates it breaks up lumps, bumps, congestion, adhesion, it will break up a bone spur. If the bone spur has been there three years, it may take three months to break it up. If it's been there three months, it may take three weeks. If it's been there three weeks, it might only take three days. So it all depends how long it's been there. But the key is consistency. Now, this is really not a poultice, it's a compress. And as a compress, it's not drawing anything out of you. It's a vehicle, this little pad is a vehicle to hold the oil so that it will penetrate into you. So every day you might apply the poultice or the compress and after you've finished you might fold it over and then the next day open it up, put a little bit more oil and apply it again. So you can use it for tumours, you can use it for cysts, uh, I met a lady who told me she'd conquered her breast cancer by castor oil, wearing the castor oil compresses. Mm -hmm. In fact, one young girl I knew had a fibroid in her uterus. They wanted to operate. 
but she wanted to do it naturally. So she took the Anna's Wild or applied the Anna's Wild yam cream to get the estrogen down and applied the castor oil compresses to her abdomen. Some people sleep with them. You can certainly have it on overnight. Some people would rather be a little bit freer at night and just let it sit in their clothes. But you need to have a plastic backing because the castor oil could soil the clothes, but done properly, it will never soil. So what you do is you, is you put a circle on in the middle. So I'll show you what I've done here. So the, the little castor oil pack is about this big. The plastic is about that big. And I've put approximately this much castor oil on. And because it's so thick, it's sitting above the pack. And as it slowly soaks through, it'll go out to about that much. And then when it goes on your warm body, it'll go out a little bit more. Can you see that? So if you do it correctly, it's not going to leak and get on everything. Because there's nothing worse than castor oil on the sheets or on your clothes. So. We're letting that sit so that it can soak in. So where would you put that? You would put that on a bone spur. You would put that on sometimes even a, a sore wrist, uh, joints. You can put it on for that. One lady had very sore knees and found that that made a big difference. You could put it on a congested chest. If it's winter and a person's got a congested chest, obviously you'd make a little bit bigger for that. Um, you may then put a hot water bottle on and that would help to to uh, warm up your poultice. Mostly the, hu the body will warm it up but if the person's got a cold and they'd like it to be warmed quickly you can do that. It can be used on the abdomen for constipation. It'll penetrate deep and break up congestion in there. I met a lady who was the wife of a doctor. She said 20 years ago I had irritable bowel syndrome and when my husband told me what he was offering medically, I said, no thanks. <laughs> and she'd heard about castor oil, so she applied castor oil compresses. And she said she healed herself. Little few dietary changes as well, as you heard last night. Um, so castor oil can be used just about anywhere. It can help to break up um, gallstones in the gallbladder. It can help to... Uh, revive the liver so your liver your gallbladder is under your right rib so you would do it to that area it applied to the kidneys it can help break up kidney stones and so there's a whole lot of areas that you can use castor oil I don't advise you take it by mouth it can be a little irritating there but topically used externally it, um, it can have quite a powerful effect now we're going to have a look at garlic. Garlic is a very potent antibiotic. In fact, the research is showing is six times more powerful than tetracycline, and that's a common antibiotic. To use it as an antibiotic, you would need probably about three of those a day. Now, if someone says, my gut couldn't handle three of those a day, what you can do is you can get a bowl of hot soup grate it into the soup and that'll just take the edge off it if a person cannot handle it raw or something delicious to put into your baked potato is to grate this straight into say on this very fine on the fine grater grate it straight into olive oil and then spoon that mix into your baked potato very very nice and some people choose to do the antibiotic sandwich which is a slice of sourdough spelt toast uh, olive oil on that and then grate this whole clove of garlic onto the slice and then avocado and tomato it is very delicious it's almost like a little mini pizza isn't it and what happens is the bread underneath and the olive oil underneath and then on top you've got the avocado and tomato it calms it down a little bit but I'm going to give you the recipe for the flu bomb or you can take the flu bomb. So the flu bomb can be used for bronchitis, it can be used for asthma, it can be used for the flu, it can be used for 
pleurisy, it can be used for pneumonia, it can be used for sinus or a head cold. The first ingredient is garlic and the garlic is crushed. I'm not putting an amount on there because some people can handle that much garlic, some people can only handle half that garlic, so it depends what you can handle. The next ingredient is ginger and the ginger is usually, well it can be finely grated and usually the ginger is about a quarter of a teaspoon. The next ingredient is eucalyptus oil. If you don't have eucalyptus oil, you can use tea tree oil and it's one drop. Next ingredient is cayenne pepper. Now some people can handle half a teaspoon, some people can handle a quarter of a teaspoon, some people can only handle a little shake. So that's up to you too. The next ingredient is lemon. If the lemons are on the tree, I say use the juice of a lemon. If they're a dollar a lemon, maybe you use half a, half a lemon. But basically lemon juice you're using. And the last ingredient is honey, and usually it's approximately one teaspoon. Even if you put in four teaspoons, it does not really um, mask the other ingredients. <laughs> and then you mix that in about a third of a cup of hot water. Now if someone has a flu or a cold or a sinus, it's usually taking one of those three times a day. So that's the flu bomb. Usually by the third day, you don't need it anymore. <laughs> that's quick, isn't it? It's quite potent, but it works. What about a baby? You can't give that to a baby. And as you saw, as you saw in my lecture uh, last night, you also can't give a baby food. So what can you do? You can finely slice garlic and you can wrap it on the bottom of the baby's foot. Now this is a very large piece of garlic. So maybe with a piece of garlic that big, you only need one. And what I would do to my babies, I'd get a little piece of cloth like this and I would put the garlic on the cloth and then wrap the cloth over it and then bind that to the bottom of their feet and then put their little sock or little shoe or booty on that. If you put a layer of cloth between the baby's skin and the garlic, it will not blister. But if you don't, you will form a big blister on the bottom of the baby's foot. And the problem then is you can't put any more garlic on till the, till the blister heals. One lady heard about garlic on the bottom of the foot and she grated it up, put it on the baby's foot. Oh, she said, yes, I have a great big blister on the baby's foot now. <laughs> but if you slice it like that, little by little, the garlic eases in through the pores on the bottom of the feet. And the garlic knows where to go. It'll go to the chest or it'll go to the, to the, the sinus areas and it can bring relief. It can even help to break up congestion in the chest. So my son James, when he was a little boy, he used to get a lot of chest colds. And I would put this on the bottom of his feet, is about two and three, and I'd put a sock on and I'd shoe on and I'd send him off to play. And every step he's taking, what's happening? <laughs> the garlic's going into his body. You can smell the garlic on their breath within a few minutes. At the end of the day, when I'd take James' shoes and socks off and I'd undo the bandage, the garlic looked like a bit of dried out piece of yellow leather. No juice left. It's all, it's all gone in to James. Now, at the same time, one has to investigate why is my child getting so many chest colds? Well, we backed onto a swamp. And when James was four, we moved to a mountaintop and James no more had chest problems. So if a child's getting recurrent chest problems, you have to look and make sure there's no mold in the house. You have to make sure that you're in a clean, dry area, but also check that often children get chest colds and sinus and uh, 
tonsils and asthma because of dairy and we looked at that last night too. My next demo is going to be of the humble potato. Now the potato is a drawer but the potato is very gentle. There are areas in the body you would not put onion and you would not put ginger and you would not put garlic but the gentle potato. So where are those areas? In the tender parts of the body. So your eyes. It's very calming and cooling for inflamed eyes, conjunctivitis, um, sprained ankle. In fact, that's what we put on Zaza when she sprained her ankle yesterday was the grated potato. The grated potato is very cooling. So if you've got an inflamed red area, the potato, because it's high in phosphorus and potassium, the skin absorbs that. And because it's very alkaline, it neutralizes the acid condition, cools it, and it can draw out and reduce the inflammation. Now, the way I make my poultices is mess-free. That's what I like, mess-free. So I wrap up Glad Wrap a few times. And what I'm aiming for with my poultice is that I've got a little bit more plastic around the edge of my poultice. So I put that down. And then I put the cloth that I'm going to make the poultice on down. And then I grate it. But this has a... So you can grate it straight onto the cloth. Now, I'm not sure what you call these in America. We call them chucks cloths. I guess that's the brand name. But I guess you call them a cleaning cloth, yeah? And they're disposable and they've got little holes in them. If someone had breast cancer, I wouldn't use this, but if someone had a, a swollen ankle or a sprained ankle, it would be fine to use for that. Be very careful you don't use too much potato because if you use too much potato, the poultice can get very wet and if the poultice leaks, is no fun. So you spread that out a little bit. So can you see how much I've put on here? And now I'm going to fold it over which is how you make the poultice. You fold over two sides like that and then you fold over the other two sides. So I now have a package and now I turn it over because where you put the poultice on you're going to put it on that side that just has one layer. So can you see how much plastic I've got around my poultice? Now let's say that I just sprained my, my wrist and it was all swollen. Then I would put it on like this and see how the plastic just covers it a little bit. I don't like too much plastic on my skin but it just covers it and then you could uh, bandage that on and if the, if, the, if the tissue is swelling you would wrap it on and keep it on all night or keep it on for a few hours. Potato is used for tissue inflammation. So there's your sprained ankle. It can be for an ingrown toenail. Um, I think it was about three years ago on my bicycle I crashed on our bridge, our wooden bridge, and a, um, a splinter went into my finger when I fell over. And that was very sore. And it was so sore you, you couldn't get it out. It was embedded in. And so I made a grated potato poultice, a little bit smaller than that, and I put it on and bound it up and slept with it like that all night. And I slept quite well. I didn't really have much pain. It was very painful when it first happened, as you can imagine, down beside, was beside the nail, but just under where the nail bed starts. The next day I, I took it off, and of course my finger's all wrinkly, but there was no pain at all. You see, what that had done is it, it had kept it from being inflamed. When, if it started to get sore, I put another grated potato on it. I think I did that about 
see this happened Friday afternoon so I did it Friday night I think I did it again Saturday afternoon and again Sunday afternoon and I think Monday again and then Wednesday morning so what's that Sunday Sunday Monday Tuesday Wednesday morning so on the fifth day I looked at it and I saw the black the black and I just pushed it and this black splinter came out and it was quite big <laughs> and it was quite fat. Now what, had hap what would have happened if I hadn't done the potato? It would have swelled right up, yeah? And would have got very red and very sore. And I go to the doctor and he says, you've got an infection. Do you know all it is is the white blood cells trying to get rid of it. And what, what, what's happening then? Painkillers, antibiotics. And yet all you need to do is keep the swelling down and the potato will keep it soft and open and it'll just come out by itself. How long do you need it to do it for? As long as it takes. Maybe if I'd done a grated potato every single day and every single night, it might have come out a little bit earlier. But I must tell you the story of what happened to my son. My younger son, William, when he was about 10, he was running around the side of a swimming pool and the people had landscaped it to make it look like an oasis. So there were old sleepers, you know, from old train tracks and ferns. And he bumped his foot that, as he was running up on a, on a sleeper that was breaking down. And he came running to me crying and I had a look and just under his toe on the ball of foot, there was a hole. And I had tweezers and I put it in as much as I dared, but I thought something must have gone in and come out. So that night, I put a grated potato poultice on his foot. And in the morning, um, it looked okay, but he was limping. So every, every night, I did a grated potato poultice on his foot. And he was still limping. And I didn't quite understand why he still was. And that's when I started to think, maybe something is in there. Now, to speed up the process, I did hot and coals. So this is a hydrotherapy, and tomorrow night uh, Vanessa is going to give you a hydrotherapy demo, so you'll be exploring this more tomorrow night. What I did was I did the hot for three minutes, and she will be explaining in more detail why this works, and I did cold for 30 seconds. And I did this three times, so that's only... 10, 10 minutes doesn't take long and it brings a lot of relief because it causes a massive amount of blood to come to the area and that pushes the old blood out. So I did that morning and I did that night and I put a grated potato poultice on it overnight. It looked quite clean and all day he'd be running around playing limping and after two and a half weeks he's still limping. And I'm not sure what to do. I'm just doing what I know. And we're managing it. And a, a friend visited and I said to him, I don't know what's the matter with William's foot. Now he did what I hadn't dared do. He pushed the bottom of William's foot. William screamed. My friend said, there's a hunk of wood in that foot. William looked at me worried because William, my youngest, was a little delicate. Now my second son, down next, to, next to William, the next one up, I could do anything to Peter. But William was a little more delicate. I had to be careful what I did. So you, you've got to change things depending on who you're working with. I said, it's all right, William will do grated potato surgery. So what I did was I did a grated potato overnight. I did the hot and coals in the morning. Then I put another grated potato on. And then in the middle of the day, I put another grated potato on. So I'm doing non-stop grated potato. I thought, we're going to speed this up. After two and a half days of that, William's foot like, looked like a wrinkled old prune, but we had to get this out. After two and a half days, when I took the poultice off in the morning, there was a black circle in the hole. I looked at it, and I got a needle, with William's permission, and I just slipped the skin back a little bit. The skin was so soft from all the poultices, and I put the needle in, into the black thing on the side and I started to pull it out. And I stopped, called the family. I mean, we, we'd been watching William limp for two and a half weeks. I didn't want anyone to miss out on this. <laughs> and then I said to William, 
you pull it out and he just pulled it out and it was an inch long the thickness of two matchsticks now in the foot it would have been so here's the foot sorry I'm not a, a great drawer but you get the gist it was about there in the foot and it was you know the hole when I saw the black in the hole it was about that big now I don't think it was like that or would it would have felt it I don't think it was like that but I think the pulp the sorry the splinter was sort of up on an angle like that grated potato and hot and coals <laughs> what did I do to the hole then because it was a mighty hole nothing absolutely nothing <laughs> because now that the offending article had been removed the body would quickly heal I did encourage him not to go barefoot in a lot of dirt and manure <laughs> so but it, but it quickly healed in fact he still has the scar there today the the round circle that's about as big as a lentil he still has that scar and he's just turned 30 what would have happened if I hadn't done the hot and coals or the potato I'd say his foot would have swelled up. Yep. S sleeper, imagine how, you know, these are old, old sleepers with lots of grime in them. I'd say a red line would have gone up his leg, rushed to hospital. The doctor might have put him on, well, he would have put him on high dose antibiotics, maybe painkillers. How old is he? He's only eight. Would he have gone and cut in? And you know what happens, if they cut there and miss it, what can they do? They're not going to slice the foot like this to try and find it. And yet, just grate a potato. William's son, little Sonny, when he was three, he stood on a rusty nail. Now little boys always want to hang around the men, don't they? And the men are on the job site, and he's just got a pair of those rubber crocs on and there's building material around and he stood on a rusty nail and it went through the crock and into his foot. It must have gone in probably about half an inch. He was crying and, we, and Mark was said to his mum, take him to grandma. So they brought him to my house and he was very dirty because he's a little boy and he's been playing in the dirt all day. So what's the first thing you do? Put him in the bath. Give him a wash and the warm water will calm him down. And then I made a grated potato banished for the bottom of his foot. It was probably about that big. Put his little foot on there, bandaged it on, put his sock on, and then put the little croc on because, you know, those rubber crocs, you can have a fairly fat bandage on and it'll slip in. And he was happy as happy then. No more pain. The potato had, had done that. That was about, oh, early afternoon. That night they put a fresh grated potato poultice on and the next day it looked clean, it was not sore, so they didn't do anything. That night they did a grated potato. Three nights they did a grated potato. After the third night, William came to me with the poultice after they took it off. He said, Mum, look at this. And on the top of the poultice there were little shavings of metal that were like a fluorescent blue colour. He said, the potato has pulled the rusty metal out of the foot and cleaned up the rusty metal. <laughs> we didn't do another thing. Why not? Well, the foot was happy. If the foot got red, if the foot got sore, you just, you just, you just do it again. It's like William's foot. Because two and a half weeks of doing this overnight hadn't done it, and I realised there was something in there, I just hit it harder just did it a little bit more often. So if you're not quite getting the results, do the hot and coals. You can do hot and coals on your feet, you can do it on your hands, maybe your elbow, and, uh, and put the poultice on. Potato is for tissue inflammation. Now we're gonna look at what's for ginger inflammation. I've just given my right hand lady the sign and she's bringing ginger. Unfortunately, we used up all the ginger in your juices. <laughs> so we're using frozen ginger. And frozen ginger, see ginger doesn't keep, you know, if you're going to have it for weeks, it's good to freeze it. But frozen ginger can be grated quite well. Thank you. 
So we're going to grate the ginger and ginger is used for joint inflammation. So you use your potato for tissue inflammation and joint inflammation you use your, your ginger. Ginger is a very powerful anti-inflammatory herb. And what you want to use is the juice. So there's quite a bit of juice coming out of this frozen ginger. So where you would use this, maybe this is a poultice for a, a toe that's got gout. Maybe this is for an arthritic finger. So you make the poultice in the same way that I made the potato one. And can you see we've got about a half an inch of plastic all the way around it. And let's say a lady has a painful joint here, an arthritic joint. Then you would put it on there and then you bandage it on. Now my, my suggestion is if you've got any painful joints and you're going to use ginger, apply it about six o'clock in the evening. Because if that joint is inflamed, the skin can get very, very hot. Some people have said, Barbara, my skin's burning. I said, the good news is your skin won't burn. But if you can handle it, sleep with it. And some people say, I can't handle the heat. I said, well, just take it off. Even just being on for half an hour will take some of the inflammation out of the joint. It appears that the ginger pulls the inflammation out of the joint to the skin. Because if there's no inflammation in that joint, it won't get hot. Now, it will not hurt it but it'll only get hot if there's inflammation in there. So very nice on lower back. If someone's got a sore lower back, they'll often put a hot water bottle on it and it'll bring a little bit of relief. Now, if they've got a sore back, there's usually inflammation there. And if they put a hot water bottle on it, it's not good for the inflammation. It can increase the inflammation. So why does it bring relief? Whenever you're in pain, the muscles cramp and you put a hot water bottle on your back, it relaxes the cramping muscles, so it brings relief because of that. Now putting a ginger poultice, if you put a ginger poultice on the lower back, you would make it about the size that I made the potato. So if you put a ginger poultice on your lower back, and what I say is put on your lower back and you can tape it on and often your pants will hold it there and you lie on your back with your knees in the air, you know, your knee up and your foot down so that the lower back goes flat. And it presses that against the lower back. Within half an hour, you start to feel the heat. <laughs> and the heat from the inflamed joint coming out to the skin, that heat relaxes the muscle and yet it's reducing the inflammation. So it brings a lot of relief. One lady with a sore lower back at our retreat was putting the ginger poultice on. She was so excited about the relief it was bringing. She wanted it in the morning, she wanted it in the afternoon, she wanted it in the evening. And after two days, her skin started to get a little sore. <laughs> so what I say is just save it for the evening. Don't do it non-stop. You'll never get sore skin from the gentle grated potato. Your skin might look like a dried you know, prune, as with William. But because the ginger is pulling that inflammation out to the skin, if you continually do it, the skin can get a little irritated. But if you just keep it for when you need it, maybe of an evening. One lady said that it got so hot, but it was an arthritic joint and it felt so good. She said, no, I want to keep it. I want to keep it on, keep it on all night. Now with vegetable matter, when you make a poultice out of vegetable matter, once it's used, it needs to be discarded. Whereas your castor oil compressor I've got there, because it's an oil, it can be used again and again and again. We had a man do our program who was a barrister. He was 38. And he said to me, I've come to the retreat to stop drinking alcohol for a week. He said, don't tell me to stop drinking alcohol because I'm not going to stop. I'm just here to have a week's rest. I just said, oh, you can't say right because it's not right. And you can't say this is terrible. I have no right to say that. So this is where you go, oh. <laughs> 
Midweek, right now, Wednesday night, we're doing the Pultus lecture and I did the demo on the grated ginger. He said, I have a little toe that sits up like that. He said, it's my middle little toe. He said, it's been paining me for 18 months. The doctor says it's gout. He said, I don't know what to do about it. He said, I am a barrister. I go to court with my wig and my robes on and I have to wear slippers. I can't even wear shoes. I said, well, let's put a poultice on it. So this was about the right size for a little toe. We put it on, maybe a little smaller. We taped it on. And whenever I apply a poultice, I always ask the guest if I can pray. And I ask for God's blessing on that poultice. And he went to bed. The next morning, now this man was very quiet, very reserved and kept to himself. The next morning he's coming down the hill because he was in one of the cabin rooms and he's yelling out. It was very um, unusual for this man to do that. And we looked down and he came running up. He said, it's gone. He said, my toe is flat and there is no pain. <laughs> one ginger poultice. Now the next day, and for you it is tomorrow, you'll be hearing the acid alkaline lecture. And when he heard the acid alkaline lecture, he then realized it was the big steak and the red wine that he was having every night that was contributing to his gout. The next day, when I had the final consultation with him, he sat in front of me and he said, I'm gonna stop drinking. <laughs> All because of one little ginger poultice. He was so happy. By the time we consulted, he'd had 48 hours of no pain. <laughs> and he was very much liking that. One man who had gout in one toe, he put this on. He said the next day it appeared in the next toe. So he put it on that toe. The next day it appeared in the next toe. It seemed to jump toes. I said, did it jump feet? <laughs> he said, no. So remember, the potato is for tissue inflammation. And remember, it can be used on eyes. It can be re re used wherever there's, there's inflammation in tender parts of the body. A friend of mine rang up and her little boy, I hear him crying in the background. He was a crawling baby. And his little penis was swollen twice the size. What are you going to do? And if you take him to hospital, what are they going to do? I said, make a grated potato poultice. It's very quick. Put that over his whole scrotum. Put his diaper on, as you say. She said within five minutes, he stopped crying and fell asleep. Poor little guy was exhausted. He slept for two hours. What does that tell you? He's not in pain. When he woke up, she took his little nappy diaper off and everything was back to normal. Sometimes you don't know what has caused the problem. The good thing about this is even though you are treating symptoms, you are also contributing to the healing. My girlfriend was a hippie and her little boy used to crawl around with no diaper or nappy on, maybe a, something bitty, maybe a little bit of dust got in the area. Sometimes you don't know. But the potato took all the swelling down, which means no more pain, and she had no more trouble with the area. If she did, what do you do? You just do that again. Can you see how you're listening and you're watching to what the body says? One lady rang me up and she said, my daughter just stood on a rusty nail. She's 10. It went almost through the top of her foot. We've seen your poultice DVD because this lecture is up on YouTube. She said, we put grated potato on. It's been an hour later and it's still a little bit sore and swollen. So I said to her, do the hot and coals. Take the poultice off, do hot and coals, and then put another fresh potato on and ring me in two hours. She rang me and she said, there's no more swelling, there's no more pain, and the little girl's laughing. Now, if she'd said to me, the pain is still there and the swelling's still there, I'm not there. So I can't tell. So I would say, well, you need to go to the, have it checked out of the hospital or the doctor. But I've actually never had to do that because everything I've done has always brought relief. That's the good news. Now we're going to have a look at cayenne pepper. Now before we look at cayenne pepper, I just 
Can you see that? We've already got a we've already got a syrup forming there. So cayenne pepper is a remarkable herb. Cayenne pepper will uh, thin the blood. Cayenne pepper will rebuild heart muscle. Cayenne pepper will strengthen the arterial walls. Cayenne pepper is a blood stimulant and anything that stimulates blood stimulates healing. In fact, it has been said that you put cayenne pepper with any other herb and you will, will increase its effectiveness. You can use it internally. You can use it for a sore throat. Yes, it'll tingle at first, but once the tingling dies down, the sore throat is greatly relieved. You can use it for low hydrochloric acid. It'll wake anything up. It wakes stomachs up. In the book Back to Eden, Jethro Kloss quotes a couple of doctors in his 10 pages on the cayenne pepper. And he's, one doctor says it's impossible to abuse cayenne pepper. Another doctor says it will never cause a lesion. It feels like it's burning, but really it's just stimulating. You can use it externally also to um, bring blood to an area. And where I find it very helpful if someone has no feeling in their feet or they have peripheral neuropathy, and sometimes that's a side effect of having chemotherapy, or if someone continually has cold feet. Perfect health requires perfect circulation, and perfect circulation means your feet and your hands are warm. So what you do if someone has cold feet, you cannot do this treatment to them. Because if they have continually cold feet and you put the cold feet in hot water, you can damage the tissues. If someone has no feeling in their extremities, you must not do the hot. You can damage the tissues. But you can do what I'm about to show you, which is a castor oil, no, olive oil and cayenne pepper compress. Now what I've got is I've got uh, um, cling wrap down there and I've got a double layer of kitchen paper and I'm going to sprinkle it with a little bit of olive oil. You could use castor oil if you like, but olive oil will suffice. And you spread it over the area because what you want to do is put enough olive oil on there so that the cayenne pepper will stick to it. Don't put too much olive oil on because if you put too much olive oil on um, the oil can leak out and that's no fun on socks and sheets. So what I've done now is I've put the olive oil on like that and now I'm going to sprinkle cayenne pepper. And what you would do is you would do about half a teaspoon to a foot. If you don't put the olive oil on there, the, the cane pepper just falls off. And then the foot goes straight on that. And that will never burn. So you, can you see what I've done now? And you see that cane pepper is sticking quite nicely to the olive oil. Then you put the foot straight on there and you put the glad wrap over and then you put a sock on. If you don't want that much glad wrap on your foot, you can just end the glad wrap a little past the kitchen paper and you put a nice firm fitting sock on. Now if I put that on someone with good circulation, by morning their feet are very hot, but not till morning. If I put that on someone with no feeling in their feet, by morning they're telling me they've got pins and needles in their feet. For someone with no circulate, very poor circulation, cold feet, it sometimes will take a few days. If I did that on my feet two nights in a row, I'd want my feet in ice water all day. <laughs> my feet would get too hot. It's a very gentle treatment. It will never hurt, but it's a very gentle way of increasing the blood supply to the extremities. So anyone who has lost feeling in any part of their body, you can apply these cane pepper compresses. And you can even make them beforehand and turn them over like that. So if you're visiting someone with it and they find it hard to make it, you can make it for them and then they can open it up and put their foot on that. Usually overnight is how you would do it. You can put it on the thyroid for an underactive thyroid. Again, any area where there's no feeling. 
Now the last we're going to look at is charcoal. Charcoal is a remarkable substance because charcoal can absorb up to, I think it's the, the figures are about 150 times its own weight in poisons. Now charcoal is unique in that it not only absorbs poison, it neutralizes poison. That's a very important point. So you can use it internally for any poisoning or you can use it internally for diarrhea. And a lot of people will travel with charcoal now when they go to Asia. You can actually get charcoal tablets. You can use charcoal externally for bee stings, wasp bites, spider bites, snake bites. But when you mix charcoal with water, it's like mixing dirt with water. So I'm going to mix it because I'm all for no mess and, and charcoal's very messy. So I'm going to mix it with psyllium. You can also mix it with uh, ground flax, but it's a pity to, I'd rather eat the flax. So I'm going to do it with psyllium, and you can use equal amounts of psyllium. So we're going to do two psyllium, and we're going to do two charcoal. Now this poultice that I'm making, it can be used on sore eyes, it can be used on bee stings, you know, any type of stings, wasp stings. It's quite incredible the way it takes the pain out almost immediately. So I'm going to mix that a little bit and then I'm going to put water in. Now if I were to mix this in a bowl then we'd have terrible trouble trying to get our, the black out of our bowl. But if you mix it in something like this there's a few pluses. One is it's not going to be messy and I'm, I do this when I'm cooking I guess. Now you seal that, seal it up and then you mix. Mix, 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 mix. And as it all mixes together you can um, spread it out and it'll start to take a bit of form because that's what the psyllium does. It sort of goes like a soft jelly I suppose. So you're massaging it all around making sure it's all quite well mixed, mixing out any lumps. And because it now goes like a soft jelly you can actually roll it out like this into the bag. So can you see that it, how it's rolled out? And now that, that, that is set now. And I'm just getting a bit more air out of it. And you can roll it with the rolling pill. Thank you, Cynthia. So it's nice and smooth. And that's taken up the whole of that plastic bag. And I'll just get a bit more air out. See now, you see what I've got now? Now you can put that in the fridge. Someone's got a bee sting. You run in here, you get scissors and you cut a square, cut the top, peel it off, take it up and slap it straight on the bee sting. So it's very, very handy. And when you put it on the bee sting, remember what you do, you cut out the size you want and then cut the top plastic off so you're putting the charcoal straight onto the skin and it's got a plastic backing and then you can just tape it on. So every house should have this in the fridge. <laughs> fridge or freezer. Fridge or freezer. If, if it hasn't been used for a while you might
put it in the freezer. And if you put it in the freezer, it's even better because if you've got a bee sting or a wasp bite, it starts to swell red very quickly and the, and the cold can help. Now, um, that is the easiest way to use charcoal. <laughs> Less mess, very handy, straight in the, in the fridge and you can cut it to, the, to what you want it. Always put the lid straight back on your charcoal. Now you see the castor oil has, um, has soaked in quite nicely. When I first put it on, it was like a lump of oil. Now do you remember what I said, that it'll spread out a little bit? Now when you put that on the body, it'll spread out a little bit more. And remember, it's just a vehicle to hold the oil to go into you. So this isn't drawing anything out of you. And when you're not using, you can just fold it over. And the next night, you'll open it and put a little bit more oil on. You'll find that as you use it, it gets a little dry because the body's taking it in. Some people say, can't you just rub the oil on? Well, it's very sticky and messy. And you're only putting a little bit on. Whereas if you use a pack, you see the thicker the pack, the more castor oil it can hold and the more castor oil can go into you. Let's have a look. Now you can see, I, it's probably an hour ago that I did this. So if you've got someone with a bad cough, in one hour you can have your, you've got enough syrup to give them a little bit. But ideally, see it starting to swim in it? Ideally you let that sit for 24 hours. And there ends our lecture. So I trust you've been inspired to get a little kit at home, get a little box and put your, your cloths in there, save up your little cloths, um, cut up old sheets and have your charcoal in there, your castor oil, your cayenne pepper. Actually, you've probably just about got it all in, the, in your kitchen anyway. Thank you for your attention.